you can define the circulation around this region of fluid. Okay? Um, so it is the integral, as you go around this path, of the component of the flow which is parallel to that path. So it is the integral around the circuit of V dot DL. Okay? That is the definition of the circulation. And, if, and what we're interested in is how do you generate circulation? So what can you do to give it a time derivative? So that you take the time derivative of this equation, d by dt of the circulation is the integral of the acceleration, dot dl, plus another term, which actually comes out to be a half of d v dot v. Now, v dot v is just a scalar, so the line integral around a circuit of a scalar is just zero, so it disappears. Okay? So it is the line integral of the acceleration, the rate of change of circulation. Now, if you say the acceleration is just dependent on pressure gradients, we don't need to be in a rotating framework to do this. We can just do it in an inertial framework. Okay. Um, then the rate of change of circulation is just the line integral of this. Um, since this is a gradient, that drops out as just being the dp over rho, the, the, the line integral of dp over rho. Now, that that raises an interesting question, okay? Because as you go around this circuit and you evaluate dp over rho and you add it all up, it may not be zero, okay? So you might be generating circulation. But only if rho changes as you go, uh, as you change p, okay. or compared to p, right? If, what am I trying to say? If, if rho is, is a function of p everywhere, then again, this this is just the integral of a constant around a, around a boundary, which will just cancel itself and, and come to zero. Okay? So you really need rho to vary with respect to p for this integral to be non-zero. So you need a situation where rho is not a function of p. Um, and that, what kind of flow is that? That's baroclinic flow, right? So this term depends on baroclinic flow. You can't generate circulation except through baroclinic processes. In a barotropic flow, you won't have any rate of change of circulation around a given boundary. Okay? That doesn't mean that you're not going to change your vorticity, though. Right? So let's move on to vorticity. Vorticity is the quantity which, if you integrate it over this area, is equal to the circulation. Right? So the circulation is the area integral of this vorticity. Right? And um, uh, the, this fits with the definition of, of uh, vorticity being the curl of the flow. So dv by dx minus du by dy. It's known as xi, the relative vorticity. It is the Laplacian of the stream function. So what does it mean, vorticity? Um, well, the best way to think about what um, the vorticity is in a flow is imagine that you drop something into the flow, okay? So take a paddle wheel, a cross type thing, and just throw it into the flow. Is it going to turn around in that flow or not on its own axis, right? So if you, imagine you drop it into this flow which is clearly turning, the paddle wheel will start to turn as well, right? And if it's turning clockwise, okay, then it's negative vorticity. Um, if it was going the other way, anticlockwise is positive vorticity. Right? Another type of flow where you could easily see that if you drop something into it, it's going to start spinning on its own axis, is this shear flow. Okay? You can see that this flow is faster than this. Drop something in, it's going to go around anticlockwise. It's going to have positive vorticity. If this object here is not, has not got any shear in it, it's just rotating as a solid body, then its circulation is just 2 pi omega r squared, where omega is the rate of rotation, and the vorticity is just 2 omega. What does that remind you of? It remind you of the solid earth as it spins, and the Coriolis parameter is 2 omega at the pole, 2 omega sine of the latitude. Right? I said the circulation can't change except through these baroclinic processes, but the vorticity can, okay? because the vorticity is the, the circulation is the integral of the whole, of the whole thing, right? over the whole area. Now, this area can change size. Okay? So imagine 
Now imagine you're dropping a necklace into the flow. You take off your necklace, do it up again, drop it into the water, and it'll start spinning around. Now imagine that there's some divergence or some convergence. Right? Then as it gets smaller, in a barotropic fluid, it has to conserve its circulation, which means that the vorticity is concentrated into a smaller area, so the vorticity must increase. Right? Or as it gets bigger, the vorticity must decrease. So to conserve this circulation, you must change your vorticity when you have divergence and convergence. And this is, we'll see in a minute, this is how you generate vorticity through divergence. So let's look at the vorticity equation now. Um, so you, you've seen the vorticity equation before. We're going to look at it again and we're going to take it apart, term by term, and see what it's useful for. All right? So how do you work out, how do you derive the vorticity equation? Well, you take the two momentum equations. The vorticity is the curl of the momentum. So the curl of the momentum equations will be the vorticity equation. Right? So you just take these two momentum equations, to you, um, for u and for v, right? you take the x derivative of one and the y derivative of the other, subtract one from the other, you eliminate these pesky horizontal pressure gradient terms, which are very complicated, and you end up with a, an equation just for the vorticity. So this is d by dt, big D by dt, so it contains all the advection terms of du, dv by dx minus du by dy. Um, is now this term is the absolute vorticity. It's the relative vorticity plus the planetary vorticity multiplied by this, and this is the divergence. Okay, and then you have this beta term, which if you if you uh, bring it into this term, then that's the rate of change of of um, absolute vorticity. Um, and then on the right hand side you have the forcing. So the forcing is what? It's wind stress or Frictional dissipation, okay? And usually that's on the boundaries. You can only generate vorticity by forcing the boundaries. It's hard to imagine a source of vorticity in, a, in, the, in the body of a fluid, right? So, another way of putting that is substantial derivative of absolute vorticity, F plus xi, is equal to absolute vorticity times divergence and the curl of the forcing, the curl of the momentum forcing. And so what do the terms give you? Well, if you just take this part, okay, this is the barotropic vorticity equation, and this is a, a particularly simple form of it in which there's no divergence. So this is for non-divergent flow with no forcing. Right? The barotropic vorticity equation expresses a conservation rule. It expresses the conservation of absolute vorticity. So if you're in a barotropic fluid with no divergence and no forcing, your absolute vorticity will be conserved following the motion. Add some forcing, and then you have a source of absolute vorticity. And this is the, uh, in the ocean, this is just uh, the advection of planetary vorticity is balanced by wind stress forcing. That is Sverdrup balance. Okay? So all your ocean circulation theory comes from, from this or maybe with a bit of dissipation if you want a stommel gyre, okay, or a monk gyre. Okay. Um, then what if we add some divergence, if we have a divergent flow, then vorticity can be generated by divergence. Okay. Now that is interesting because what else does divergence do? It changes the thickness of a layer. So that gives us the link between changing layer thickness and changing vort vorticity. Right? If you have a convergent flow, it's going to make the layer thicker. And that, so that's why this term also gets called the vortex stretching effect. So you, you, you make the layer thicker, you're going to spin up some vorticity. Right? Um, and then finally, there's a term which is not in this because uh, we basically use the Boussinesq approximation when we were deriving the shallow water equations. But uh, there's this term which is... Um, it looks like this. It's a baroclinic vorticity generation term. So it comes from that um, generation of circulation that I showed you in the circulation theorem if you have a baroclinic fluid. But for the atmosphere and ocean, it's important on smaller scales. It's not particularly important for very large scale dynamics. Um, right, so again, there are some details here. If you're interested in the derivation of all that, okay. 
So let's go on and talk a bit more about what I've just been saying about the generation of vorticity by divergence. We're going to take the continuity equation, which we've been using in this flux form, so the flux of mass or the flux of layer thickness um, determines the rate of change of layer thickness, and you can easily express that in terms of the substantial rate of change of layer thickness. So as you follow a parcel, how is its layer going to get thicker or thinner? Okay. So that's big D by dt of h, and that is given by this, h times the divergence. Okay? So there you have it. D by dt of h is minus h times the divergence. Looks very similar to D by dt of absolute vorticity is equal to minus absolute vorticity times the divergence. Right? Those two equations are the same. The equation for vorticity and the equation for conservation of mass are the same. And so, how can we take advantage of that? Remember, when, when I was talking about the barotropic non-divergent case, we didn't have this term, and we said I had a conservation principle for the absolute vorticity. How about if we include this term now? Can we derive another conservation principle? Right. So we combine these two equations and eliminate the divergence between them. Okay? And we'll end up after a bit of messing about, we'll end up with this equation, which is the absolute, the, 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 um, absolute derivative of this quantity, which is the ratio of the two, F plus psi, the absolute vorticity, divided by the layer thickness. That is conserved. Okay, that's conserved even when you have divergence in the fluid. Right? And this is called the potential vorticity. Right? Um, so it's another way of thinking about how divergence affects vorticity, you can think about the conservation of this quantity, potential vorticity. Right? And um, it's a, a very compact way to express the dynamics in general. It's, it's generalizable to more complicated flows in which you have. Um, so so you, you can talk about uh, potential temperature surfaces and how PV is conserved in the atmosphere on potential temperature surfaces. So let's think about a couple of cases in which changing layer thickness generates vorticity. So let's say you've got some low-level convergence, which is going to bring you a cold dome, a kind of air mass of cold air coming in and creating this lump between density surfaces. Right? And so you can call that vortex stretching, if you like. Right? What it is, is that if you're going to conserve potential vorticity, if your layer is going to get thicker, right? h gets bigger, and f stays the same, then xi must get bigger, right, to conserve this ratio. So if xi gets bigger, it becomes positive. Assuming it was zero before, it becomes positive, and you have this anti-clockwise flow around this cold dome, right? Now imagine that you've got a mountain or a, or a sea mount, a bump at the bottom of the ocean, right? As the flow goes over it, the layer gets thinner, right? There'll be divergence. And um, divergence will generate negative vorticity, this clockwise flow, right? Um, by, the same, by the same argument, right? Or you can even go a step further and you can say, well, let's, let's say we're in a situation where um, F dominates. The planetary vorticity is very important. It could be a very rapidly rotating planet or it could be um, just talking about very large scales, right? <coughs> and in, if, so let's say that this has to be conserved, F over H. Right? Is that possible? Well, it's, it's possible if, if you just don't change H. So you can just stay on, a, on an H contour and just make sure you don't, don't move to another position where H is different. So that's one way of changing, uh, of conserving F, F over H. Um, and that, that's the kind of situation where you get these rotating fluid systems which are kind of stuck in place over the bottom topography. Those are called Taylor columns. Okay. Now, if F starts to vary, so if you're a big enough scale, so you have appreciable changes in the, in the latitude, um, then it starts to get complicated again. And you know, if F varies, then H has to vary, uh, or, or you have to change the vort relative vorticity. You'll end up with a flow which is starting to oscillate, and that's a Rossby wave. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about Rossby waves um, the week after next. Okay. Right, finally, 
So think of another way of understanding conservation laws, right? Because we've talked about the conservation of mass, we've talked about the conservation of absolute vorticity in a barotropic non-diversion flow, and we've talked about the conservation of potential vorticity. Potential vorticity, particularly interesting, right? Why is it conserved? What does it mean to call it potential vorticity? It's not the vorticity, right? It doesn't even have the same uh, dimensions as vorticity. It's vorticity divided by, by height, right? So we call it the potential vorticity, right? And, and uh, it's because it's a label, right? It's because you're attaching a label to something. So you, you can imagine something moving around and changing its vorticity as it goes around. Um, but it's got this label, which is its potential vorticity, which never changes. Right? It's like me, right? I, I can move around the world, okay? Uh, but I have a passport. It's my English passport, right? And it says that I drink tea, basically, because I'm English, right? Uh, but if I come to France, then I'm going to drink wine, okay? If I go to Mexico, I'll drink tequila. If I go to Russia, I'll drink vodka. But I'll always have this passport with me, which says, basically, I'm a, I'm a tea drinker, all right? So I can move around, and it will change my state, okay? depending on how much I drink. But when I, I have a place of reference, and when I go back there, I always go back to the same state, okay, with a nice cup of tea. And it's the same for, for example, potential temperature. What is potential temperature? Right? Air in the atmosphere can go up and go down. When it goes up, it gets cold. It comes down, it warms up again. Right? It doesn't conserve its temperature. But it conserves its potential temperature because that is the temperature it would have if you took it adiabatically to 1,000 millibars, right? And that's its kind of label that you just attach to it. And, and because it never changes, it's a, it's a reference, you can call it a conserved quantity. You can plot maps of it, right? It's a, it's a variable that is conserved following a flow. Same thing with potential vorticity. Potential vorticity, you take it uh, to a reference pressure and you take it to the equator where there's no planetary vorticity, that's the relative vorticity it would have, right? Okay, so um, it's the same thing. It's a label, potential vorticity. 